it seems like every book on architecture has to try to define what software architecture is. C-level executives these days, especially in technology, are way different than they were 30 or 40 years ago. You can't have an architecture unless you know what software you're developing. And events are all about human communication. I have witnessed quite a few organizations that are very, they, they think in synchronous fashion, they think in request response, they think in calls, and then it, it tends to get them in trouble. You know, life is not a podcast, right? This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. Hi, James Higginbotham. Uh, I'm author of The Principles of Web API Design and founder of LaunchIny, an API consulting firm. Uh, I'm here with Vaughn Vernon today. Vaughn is a software developer and architect with over 35 years of experience across a broad range of business domains. He's also a leading expert in domain-driven design and a champion of simplicity, which I really love. In addition, he's the founder of an open source uh, product called or platform called Vlingo Zoom, and uh, which is a set of DDD-friendly distributed computing tools. Uh, they the tools simplify concurrent, reactive, event-driven, and microservice architectures, and it's all built on the Java virtual machine. Now, if that's not enough. He's also the author of the book, Strategic Monoliths and Microservices, as well as an editor of a new signature series from Pearson and Addison Wesley. So Vaughn's here today to share some info, insights from his new book. Uh, great to speak with you, Vaughn. Um, let's start off by having you tell us a bit about your signature series with Pearson, Addison Wesley. Sure. And thank you to uh, GoTo for inviting me to be interviewed and and uh, my suggestion to have you, James, interview me, and it's good to be with all of you. Um, well, I would say that my signature series has the first goal of trying to help developers, software developers of all kinds, to mature. And by maturity, um, I don't mean simply like knowing more about some programming language. Of course, that's always important, but um, my thinking on maturity is more around uh, being, you know, having a business centric focus on software development where software developers are, um, you know, less drawn to tinkering with new toys and hacking code, but um, more about learning what the benefits are of drawing close to the business, having a good partnership with business stakeholders and developing software that really has um, strategic value. So in doing that, the series also emphasizes um, organic refinement, meaning that um, things emerge as we learn more and we uh, look at software projects more as um, learning experiences and uh, through experimentation and discovery. And so as we learn more, the software gets better. And as we um, go through that, we're, you know, looking into specifically topics such as uh, reactive object and functional based architectures and programming, as well as domain modeling. And of course, uh, including domain driven design, um, creating services that um, might fit what would be called microservices uh, by some, um, but again, demonstrating purposeful architecture around that. Um, also patterns and like your book, James, um, APIs and the patterns that you talk about there in your book. And so we're, we're trying to promote the um, best uses of such tools and any underlying technologies that match up with those. So really a, an architecture and design focus where um, technology and, and programming um, underpins that, but those things are not the, the primary focus. Yeah, that's fascinating. You, you, a lot of the things that you mention. Uh, you even called that out. You know, it's not just about programming languages. I mean, there's definitely an aspect to that, but there's more to it. You're really helping the development community really move beyond just the technology. And it sounds like you're helping them 
engage in the business side of things and the product thinking side of things, other elements of that. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, James, as uh, we've spoken about before and um, my interview with you on, on another podcast, um, you know, we're, we're quite interested in learning what the business needs are, whether we're consulting first and then training or training consulting, whatever it happens to be. We're looking for ways to improve the business value um, and not just showing uh, developers, you know, like new techie type things that, of course, it is technology, obviously, but yes, trying to improve the practices um, first. Yep. That's great. Yeah. This, I'm, I was really excited for this signature series when you mentioned that you had this opportunity. Um, I think those that are probably familiar with this, with the signature series from, from Pearson in the past with Martin Fowler's series and others, I think there's a lot of people that have taken advantage of those and really, you know, matured their career and their thinking and, and, and changed the way maybe they've approached software design, systems design, solution, architecture as a result of those. So this is, this is going to be a great series. I'm, uh, I've seen some of the titles already and I'm looking forward to some that are, that are uh, still being written as well. Yeah. And it, it gives a great opportunity to introduce new authors um, sort of under maybe the wing of, of the series where um, maybe they aren't as well known to the community, but they should be. And, and so, you know, being in the series um, helps to, um, I guess, both validate, but more promote the ideas of other people and show that, that there are, there's a lot of wisdom out there to be shared. So, and thank you again for being an author in the series. Yeah. Th- thanks for the opportunity. It's, it's an honor to be part of that series. So let's, let's dive in now to the book. Uh, you, your book is strategic monoliths and microservices. Um, who did you write that for and, and why did you write it? You know, what drove you? I mean, writing a book is, is a passion project. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of time. So uh, tell us a little bit about why you've written this book. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I've noticed in probably, you know, mostly since my red book, the implementing domain driven design book that, um, there, there continues to be a big, um, chasm maybe, or gap between, um, business people, you know, those who are primarily interested in, um, the innovation around their business and, developers, um, and, you know, developers really latch on to domain driven design. They really want to learn it. But what I found is, um, there's always just sort of this still a a very technical bent to those who want to learn DDD. And even when giving clear opportunity to interact with business people, um, they, they actually tend to either shy away from it or, or decline the opportunity and they'll say things like, no, we've got this, you know? So it's, it's still this kind of like closed circle of developers who are trying to think about, um, the ways, you know, that the software should work without really engaging with the business. So in, you know, in, in making those observations and writing books that are primarily for architects and developers, I started to think, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice if executives had the opportunity to know um, at a slightly less technical level than, than uh, say, architects or programmers of, of various, kind, various levels, where they could understand the kinds of decisions that could be made and the possibilities without actually, um, you know, stepping on the toes of, of developers at the same time. So, um, and I just want to make clear that the book is for C-suite, you know, senior VPs, VPs, directors, managers of, of software projects. Um, but it's also, you know, can range through chief architect, senior architect, enterprise architect, um, even, you know, 
senior developer, mid-level developer, even junior developers, because these are the kinds of things, the mindset that really needs to occur um, to, to be, you know, developed in software teams if they really, truly want to innovate. So the book is, again, meant for a range of roles, but it's written in such a way that um, certainly is compatible with uh, C-level executives. And I just have to say, too, that C-level executives these days, especially in technology, are way different than they were 30 or 40 years ago, you know, sort of when I was getting my start in software. You know, I, I talk about the sort of Wall Street or, you know, Midtown Manhattan look with pinstripe suits and vests and all this stuff. And there, there's not anything wrong with that. But, you know, when you really look at the founders of today of startups and even uh, executives in you know, large uh, enterprise or um, fortune companies and global companies, they really have a completely different mindset than that. And, and they're more, you know, casually dressed, but also they're really very technically savvy. So um, I didn't in any way, you know, we, Tomas and I, my co-author, didn't, you know, in any way dumb down the book. But we made sure that we didn't, you know, dive too deeply into bits and bytes and things like that, because that isn't really mostly about in innovation most of the time. Wow, that's 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 a great point. And I've seen that as well in the organizations I work with, the the C-suite, they're they're deeply technical. We're having deep technical conversations with them. They're sitting down and drawing, at least in my experience, sitting down and drawing diagrams and things and trying to work through the problems at a much deeper level. So having a resource like this that helps to uh, unify the thinking and to speak to that broad audience allows the C-suite down to the junior developer to all be kind of speaking the same language, thinking about the same things in the same way. And it seems to be a really powerful way to uh, approach a book like this. Um, so strategic monoliths and microservices, I, I think that's a really interesting title. It feels like a blend between the, the business or technical strategy worlds and, and some of the architectural decisions we have to make. Why did you choose that title? Did it come to you instantly? Was it something that took a little while to to emerge? Tell me a little bit about the origins of of, of the of the title of the book and and kind of the the general um, you know vision or mission of this book and what what you're trying to set out to do and how all that ties together. Yeah, great question. Um, first of all, titles of books that's that's a really interesting um, subject in itself. Actually. Implementing Domain Driven Design, my, my first book, The Red Book, um, I had that title from the beginning and it, and it stuck. I think that this book's title changed about five times before um, it was ready and, you know, we actually chose one to, to use. And it really took a lot of ruminating over time to, to consider all the angles and so forth. We knew that we wanted to write about um, monoliths and microservices and, you know, sort of the overarching ideas of strategy um, and innovation. But yeah, I, th I think that where what we finally landed on was both a main title, strategic monoliths and microservices, and a subtitle that kind of harmonize. And uh, the way that they do that is uh, strategic and the subtitle driving innovation go together and then monoliths and microservices in the main title and using purposeful architecture so those two you know titles kind of like are are um you know i guess a bit parallel and woven together so that was the idea is put more emphasis on strategic um innovation and of course, our archi software architecture is extremely important, but you can't have an architecture unless you know what software you're developing. And when someone rushes into um, architecture because this is what they love and they're, they're just sort of like um, trying to fit things together that they assume will be necessary, I think that often there, there's a, 
you know, lack of real thought as to purpose. So trying to emphasize that first comes the strategy, the understanding of how we will be innovative, and then what do we need to to make that happen in terms of software architecture. In the first chapter, you seem to focus in on kind of three areas, at least that stood out to me, is business transformation, software architecture, and the inevitable element of change. And you seem to kind of set up the whole book from that, from at least those three elements. That's what stood out to me. So can you can you talk a little bit further about what, you know, we talked about kind of how the title was inspired and what you're looking at, but let's talk a little bit more about what people are experiencing in their day to day. You know, uh, every organization's going through a digital transformation of some sort. Uh, and, and we're all having to deal with, with changes and evolution of software architecture and, and the change throughout. So how are these elements connected or how are you tying those together in the book? Yeah. So yeah, definitely every, company that I engage with is going through a transformation, digital transformation. Um, and I, what I find though, is that sometimes digital transformation is simply like, um, lift and shift to the cloud, you know? And to me, that's actually really not digital transformation. And I think where innovation is really a, a sought after goal, um, most people wouldn't really consider that, you know, innovation. Like, like what I say, or transform uh, digital transformation. Like I say, um, you know, Amazon um, sort of making their their enterprise computing stack available uh, um, to the outside world. That's innovation, right? I mean, they had it. It was working. It scales tremendously. And they say, okay, then let's sell time shares for this, basically, right? Uh, usage um, metering for, for the use of this. Okay, that's transformation, definitely, um, and innovation. But, you know, subscribing to that and spending money for it and just moving your same software over there is not really digital transformation. It's just, you know, sort of like new hardware in a different form or something like that. I, you know, so I like to emphasize that digital transformation is all about innovation, that you're actually trying to transform um, in areas where either the digital aspects of your business were sort of simple, you know, like too simplistic, not um, uh, carrying enough, you know, sort of business weight, or there's still manual processes within the business. And we're trying to take, you know, every situation there and turn it into a digital experience um, that will drive, you know, big revenues for the companies that, that, engage in in that process and you know take the risk and investment in it so so can you kind of walk us through kind of given that background about digital transformation and kind of the, the view you're seeing of how software is having to, to change and organizations are changing now can you walk us through the four main topics or parts of your book and kind of talk about what they cover give the the give everybody a chance to understand what what does your book cover how what are you uh, what are you approaching in in this book yeah sure and uh, actually I, I realized I didn't fully answer your question so how does architecture and change fit into that well um, if you're going through a digital transformation transformation doesn't happen overnight and certainly doesn't happen even extremely quickly when you're moving from sort of this big ball of mud, you know, tangled legacy system. Um, and so you need to have an architecture that will facilitate change. And even if you're starting kind of, you know, from scratch in a lot of uh, digital transformation areas, like really innovating, you still need architecture that facilitates change, right? So yeah, that hopefully that sort of answers the first part of that. The four sections then are that... Um, you know, how do we look at 
transformation in general. That's kind of the first part of the book. And how do we develop the right mindset for innovation, for actually engaging meaningfully with um, business stakeholders and software developers and, you know, um, users or customers of the software that will be eventually available for use so that we can make the best software and actually make, create breakthroughs, realize breakthroughs in uh, what we offer. Um, and then some tools that can be used to do this and very lightweight, very, um, you know, flexible and tools that support agility, agile as in agility. Um, and we, we kind of, you know, in the book kind of steer away from the heavyweight, what is considered agile, but where it tends to have a lot of ceremony, um, you know, associated with it. So we, we kind of formulate that in the first part. The second part is, um, uh, about domain driven success. So domain being identified as a sphere of knowledge, but also the, the business domain, the, you know, this sphere of knowledge about the business, but then in smaller parts of the business where we're really focused on innovation, what do those um, spheres of knowledge look like? Um, what's driving us to um, try to, you know, innovate within those, but then also balancing that, that kind of investment with a recognition that all software is not um, strategic. It's necessary, um, but it might be supporting or generic. And so how do we um, balance, you know, the kind of investment that we need to make without putting too much um, money and time into areas or, or at least not the human uh, capital time that, that um, you know, the, the business needs to use for these um, innovations, but maybe spend some money on off the shelf or download open source, you know, um, components and so forth to, to support that. Um, so there's a good balance there to be found. And so this is where we do talk about domain driven design, but we actually kind of delay the introduction of the term domain driven design because um, we didn't want um, higher level, um, you know, executive management and so forth to, to kind of hear yet another one of these, you know, what, what might appear to them to be buzzword while, you know, you and I and others understand that it's not really a buzzword. It's a, it's a way of thinking and a, and an approach to software development, but we kind of sneak up on them a little bit in that sense and, and, and say, and describe what, um, what we're doing and why we do it and then say, oh, and by the way, you know, not, not that it's really a, by the way, but, you know, Eric Evans wrote about this, whatever, nearly, I guess, 18 years ago or 19 years ago now, I don't remember for sure. Um, and this is what it's called and here are the parts of it. And then, and then we just don't like keep saying stuff like that. We just show them how to use it. Um, then the, the third part of the book is um, event driven architectural, you know, or event first architectures where, um, you know, we're, we're talking about how events are extremely important to the development of any software. Um, and I'll get back to that in, in a moment. And, and then what are the software patterns, both um, whether it's, you know, web-based or um, messaging based or whatever it happens to be, what are, what are the technical tools that we have and the patterns that can be used to really highlight and accommodate events as a first class idea and software development and how that really helps with um, innovation. The fourth part of the book, pardon me, is uh, um, about um, monoliths themselves and microservices, but taking kind of two approaches to this. One is um, 
monoliths like you mean it, right, is, is the name of one of the chapters. And, and what that means is if you're going to develop monoliths um, and you find this to be a purposeful architecture, um, this is how you want to go about doing it so that it doesn't turn into a tangled, you know, big ball of mud mess. Um, and what if you already have a tangled big ball of mud mess, but you need to transform that um, into a well-modularized monolith before you do anything else, how do you deal with that kind of situation? Um, and then um, the next chapter, it's in fact, chapter 11 is um, introducing microservices like a boss, right? So this is where um, you really have a good reason to use microservices. And perhaps this includes using both monoliths and microservices in the same system uh, solution. And then how do you go from, um, you know, the, the tangled big ball of mud and, and reach microservices? Well, you might first want to go back and remodularize or, or modularize that big ball of mud using the advice in the previous chapter. But if you, um, if you're brave enough to sort of just, you know, bulldoze forward with, um, we're just going to go right from big ball of mud to microservices. Well, we discuss that as well and how you can be successful with that. And we've, you know, uh, Tomas and I have had both had experience with this. So we, um, you know, feel that we provide, uh, very good advice and techniques for doing this. Um, finally, we kind of wrap up with this, what I think is a very sort of poignant, um, uh, last chapter, chapter 12, which is, um, require balance, demand innovation, right? Or demand strategy. So it's, it's really saying, yeah, you know, again, let's just sort of review this in a few words. Um, remember that architecture is providing a purposeful means to, um, develop software innovation, you know, on, on a kind of, uh, foundation. Um, but the innovation itself needs to happen for there to be any reason for a uh, software architecture to even be a, you know, concern at all. So those are the four uh, parts. Now I just, I said, I would come back to that whole idea of, um, events and, and a really important thing to remember is, is that we introduce, um, you know, Mel Conway's um, really, you know, amazing brainchild of Conway's law, what's become known as Conway's law um, from the year 1967, really didn't get any daylight until 1968. And then Fred Brooks um, recognized it as, wow, this is really important work, you know, and, and included in the Mythical Man Month book. Um, and since then, you know, we've really learned that um, Conway's law is undeniable. It's there. It's like the law of gravity. Um, you, you really don't get better at the law of gravity. You simply have to work within the, the bounds of, you know, the law of gravity, the, you know, realizing that if you fall even, you know, a few meters or yards or whatever, um, you know, measurement system you're using, uh, you can get very hurt or even die from, you know, such an impact. So um, given that, what do we do with the law of gravity? Well, you know, we know that we can only jump and stay in the air so long. So we, you know, learn to coordinate certain things like if we're playing basketball or football or, you know, whatever it happens to be, we, we learn how to use the, the, um, our knowledge of the law of gravity and the feeling that we have in our own bodies for, you know, how long we can sustain some move or, or, um, you know, airtime or whatever it happens to be. And in the same way, you know, when we're aware that communication within an organization will have a direct impact on the software or the system, actually any kind of system, but a software system in this case, um, you know, and, and the outcome of that, then we better 
make some very good decisions about the kind of organizational um, communication structures that we put together. And what's amazing to me is that, you know, uh, Mel Conway not only had the knowledge to, to, to observe that organizations will absolutely create systems according to their organizational communication structure, but that he said, okay, then, um, this means that you should basically incentivize um, leaders in your organization who are flexible and create flexibility within the organization communication in order to do this. So, okay, what does this have to do with events? Well, events are all about human communication. It, they really are. Um, so we have, you know, an opportunity to, you know, what happens when I'm, when, you know, when I finish talking to you, James, when I, when I finish, you know, when I finally run out of breath <laughs> and, and you can talk again, what happens? Well, it's sort of like an event, right? You recognize that there's this Vaughn stop talking event and now you're going to react to that. Well, it's the same way with software. When, when various things happen in software, we want to record as a communicative um, record that this occurred. And because it's an important occurrence, then even, you know, the, the monolith or microservice that we're building or others throughout the, the system that we're working with can consume that as a means of, you know, telling them that this happened. It's a form of communication and our communication itself that is being relayed around the entire system and the system can react to it. So um, this is why we really focus on events through the book and the tools that we provide in the book are, are very much, you know, like event centric. I have witnessed quite a few organizations that are very, they, they think in synchronous fashion, they think in request response, they think in calls. Um, and then it, it tends to get them in trouble, particularly when they're going down a microservices path because they, as you said, they maybe have a, a big ball of mud or maybe they're just trying to transform the way that they do things. They're trying to scale up. They're trying to reorganize the, the, the way that they work. And so they break things, decompose big problems into smaller problems. But they create this level of fragility as a result of making a, a call to a service, which makes another synchronous call to a service, and they create these call chains. Um, the result of that then is instead of a single process with code that's chaining calls together, we're chaining calls over the network. And anywhere along the way in that call chain, we could have a network problem. We could have something that's not available. So can you talk a little bit about how events really help to transform the organization into being more resilient, less fragile from by shifting toward an event model, thinking more in terms of events rather than synchronous call chains and service call, service call, service and, and encountering those kinds of problems? Sure. And actually what you said is, is a really good um, way to highlight that. Um, communication is, again, a very fundamental part of this because in life, you know, life is not a podcast, right? I mean, right now you're waiting for me to stop talking. So it's sort of like that service call, service call, service call, right? Where um, you're waiting for me to stop talking so that you can do the next thing or I'm waiting for you to start stop talking, ask me a question, and then I do the next thing. But, um, you know, communication, human life doesn't really work that way. Rarely do I say to you, talk to someone um, about some topic, and then I literally wait for minutes, hours, days, weeks, months for you to like fulfill that request that I made because it might take a lot of time for that whole you know, your part of the conversation to, to conclude 
how productive would that be? So when you just think about just normal human interaction, um, events make perfect sense because events help us to, in essence, embrace latency. Latency happens on the network. There is, you know, even um, you, you might think that, you know, well, we're deploying to Google and Google has the fastest network on earth. Nobody can, you know, do better than Google, but, you know, <laughs> talk to Google about how much latency they have. I mean, I'm sure, you know, th they're super fast, but I will guarantee you that there are engineers there trying to squeeze more out of it, trying to find ways to, to make it even faster and more reliable. So, um, you know, given that when you capture an event and you persist it, and that is successful, then you have this kind of, you know, long-term, even forever kind of record that can be distributed once to other parts of the system, or it can be distributed um, time and time again um, to newer systems, right, that, that didn't exist before. And when that distribution occurs, as in a broadcast or a, a publishing, a publishing such an event, you simply have to know that the event was published. And if you know that when the event was published, you kind of can now relax and forget about it, right? So you, if you ever think of software relaxing, you know, the, it's probably more about our brains are relaxed saying, okay, I know that it's persisted. And I know that the messaging mechanism has this and it, it's going to guarantee me that at some point it's going to be delivered, you know, and, um, and now, you know, given that at some future time, some other component will react to that event and do something about it. And I might be interested in the fact that something, some conclusion was reached and I'm, Therefore, would pro you know, I would want to know about the event that happened in the other system. And but but I'm not worried about setting timeouts for, you know, rest requests. I'm not saying, well, if this rest request doesn't um, succeed within five seconds, we're done here. Right. Failure. And how many cascading, you know, um, you know, impacts will that have? potentially across, you know, a, a large part of the enterprise. Instead, we're just saying, well, we know that this worked and we know that we're expecting something back, but we'll just react to it when we see it. Then if it happens in six seconds or 16 seconds or 60 seconds, as long as that's within a business time frame that's acceptable, we're good, right? We, we, we're not worried about, you know, user requests stacking up on our web tier waiting to be handled because this thread is tied up on waiting for something else and we can't let it wait for more than five seconds. Otherwise, you know, we start experiencing other problems up upstream. So, you know, it just really changes your, your whole mindset and the resiliency part comes in simply because um, if there is a failure in delivery um, then for example, you know, that, that event will be eventually delivered, <clears throat> um, given that the cloud, many companies are really, you know, very much, um, dependent on the cloud. Now, if there is a failure in some machine or part of the network, we can, you know, bring up nodes, uh, whatever it is, you know, or, or make a, a function available or a, a Lambda available in another, you know, area to handle that, well, you're going to get some uh, very kind of welcoming and, and naturally feeling resiliency. Of course, th this is a, a bigger topic than, than that. I don't want to just oversimplify it, but um, that is the basic idea of the benefits. I, I, I loved how you said software relaxing. I had this picture of this microservice on a recliner kick back and just kind of waiting for an event to come its way. But no, yeah. I, 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 I fully agree with you. I've, I've, I've worked with event driven architectures in the past. I first got introduced to them with 
message oriented middleware and, you know, and messages accusing topics on message brokers and things and connecting different enterprise systems. But having worked with a lot of organizations that have these either long running processes, like you said, where it could take a while before we are able to fulfill the task at hand, the work that needs to be done, or maybe just the, as you said, the increased latency of dealing with cohabiting software with other people on shared hardware in the cloud or dealing with crossing boundaries across regions or just simply some system gets overwhelmed or overloaded and therefore would have a negative impact on something that was working synchronously to shift ourselves to thinking asynchronously and to really start to uh, embrace that as an architecture to make that shift uh, obviously will take time, but has a lot of benefits to it. Um, do you have any examples or something you can share, even if you, if the, the, the parties remain nameless, of how you've helped people to transform that mindset from a, a synchronous call, request response, maybe more REST-oriented way of, of building software internally to a more event-driven, reactive approach to doing things and, and how that, how that you know, kind of evolved and, and kind of the results and the, the fruits of that labor. Yeah, well, I'm working with multiple teams right now um, in areas like that. Um, Previously, you know, there, yes, it, it's a very different way of thinking. Again, um, you know, the, the whole service call makes service call. It seems natural to developers because they're used to making, you know, function calls or method invocations, you know, and, and then those uh, methods that are called make other calls. And, it, and it's like, well, that always works, you know. Um, very rarely will it fail. And so it just seems natural. And it is a big mind shift for people to go through to accept that. Um, and what I try to do is just, you know, really simplify, make, make the whole idea sound much simpler than they tend to consider it, you know, up front. And, you know, when they hear about this asynchrony, wow, that's really, you know, difficult stuff. Never done that before. Well, of course they have. If you've ever written a web UI or an old, you know, Windows API app or what, even if you're using Visual Basic, you know, you have done, you have worked with asynchronous messaging, right? You do not know when a user clicks the mouse or when they've selected some button or, you know, whatever it clicked some button, whatever it happens to be until you receive a notification that that occurred. And you're not constantly saying, you know, Hey, UI, did they click that button yet? Did they click the, you know, an item in the list box? Did they scroll the list box? Did they, you know, it, you just receive notifications of those things. And that is really just, what we're talking about. So anybody who is in fear of this is really, you know, they, they don't need to be. It is it is far simpler than most people um, have the idea. But you do kind of like need to shift your mindset. And like I said, if if you send, um, uh, you know, an event to. Um, to another party and you're expecting something back within some, some time frame, well, you simply remain inactive or doing other things until that occurs. Um, and so you, you have to have in mind that you won't know immediately the result of that. So you have some state somewhere that, that has been saved and, you know, persisted in some way, whether it's in memory or, whether it's on disk. And, and so you can then recall that when you are notified about the, you know, the result that you were interested in, in seeing. So I, I would love to talk about some of the, you know, concrete experiences, but it, it's been everywhere from just trying to get people to, um, you know, drop the idea of everything is a rest call, um, helping teams see that if they, if they don't make those eventually consistent service to service to service calls that that 
will fail and fail on a daily basis, not necessarily in large mass of those, but, um, but then you won't need to hire a team or your team will be much smaller in dealing with the inconsistent data that exists when you wake up in the morning or, you know, throughout the day because one of those services failed. And um, it is really difficult to, to get people to understand that and buy into it. But again, I think it's mostly just the, the um, kind of fear factor of doing something that seems unfamiliar until, you know, maybe you can help them to see that it is not um, completely foreign to them. Uh, so you had previously mentioned the idea of purposeful architecture. What is purposeful architecture? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it means that um, the architecture has a design that facilitates the um, the software that you're the, the actual you know solution to the business problem that you're trying to solve, and this means that it's it's reflecting what the business needs. And so if, you know, if a developer goes in or an architect goes in and starts like, you know, deciding, making architecture decisions early before they've even engaged with the business, it's, you know, it's, it's like, don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my mind made up, right? It's, you're just, you're just concluding that we are going to use these facilities because that's what I want to use, or that's what we as a technical team want to use on this. And so, you know, it's got to be Kafka and it's got to be, um, you know, Kubernetes and it's got to be all this stuff. And, hey, you know, go to the, you know, just for example, go to the Kubernetes leaders and they'll, they'll be the first to tell you, you may not want to be using Kubernetes, you know, just because it's out there, you know, there, there is, a price to pay for for going there, and it does a lot of great things. I'm uh, I don't want to be misunderstood that I'm knocking on, you know, uh, Kafka or Kubernetes, but um, hey, make those decisions when you need to. That's that's purpose driven. It's actually responsibility, right? It's showing that you're that you're responsible in your decisions and um, that you're making decisions based on what you. Are working on. So, so to, to kind of tie that back, we talked about events and event driven architecture and thinking about things in that way to introduce resilience, resiliency and, re, and overcome latency issues and handle long running transactions or workflows, those kinds of things, as well as many other scenarios. It sounds like then what you're saying is a, a purposeful architecture is really about what does the business need or what would it benefit from? And, and so therefore, would it benefit the business for me to perhaps select a different approach than maybe something that I would normally use because there's a lot more benefit to the business as a result? So maybe event driven would be beneficial in some cases, in many cases, perhaps, as a result of that, is that is that what you're saying here with purposeful architecture? Yes, absolutely. And but also maybe event driven is the very wrong thing to use in in some cases, right? If it's a simple web app that um, is just collecting data, and somehow you can uh, access that data in batch form or you know simple queries, maybe that's all that you really need to do. So. Um, yeah, it, it's just really being responsible, making decisions based on the real needs, not because your mind is already made up on on how this is going to work. Yeah, making those automatic decisions that we go to just because we've done it before, let's do it again. We achieved success before, so we must automatically, that must automatically mean we're going to achieve success again when what you're saying is slow down and be very thoughtful uh, about an intentional rather than just defaulting to either uh, something new that's emerging or something that we've done in the past has been successful. Let's, let's reason through this and determine the right, the right path. It's the, the benefit to the benefit of the business as well. Yeah. In, in chapter eight of um, the book, we start out just kind of like taking some previous definitions of software architecture. What is software architecture, right? It seems like, Every book on architecture has to try to define what 
software architecture is, but we, we show um, what others have said about software architecture. They're generally quite brief. Um, we actually wrote about two small paragraphs about software architecture. And the thought that we're trying to convey is you cannot decide what your architecture should be until you've had communication. And the communication is going to tell you um, the kinds of software, you know, modeling that you're going to do, the, the kinds of components that will need to be created. And that might lead to, you know, one architecture decision or another. There are sort of some go-to architecture patterns or, or styles that I think are generally always useful, but these, these don't impose a certain, you know, sort of way of using distributed computing. I would say the hexagonal or ports and adapters architecture is just sort of like a smart way to go. And that's not, that's not setting, that's far from setting things in stone. It's actually making um, the software much more flexible and capable of introducing new, um, mechanisms, new kinds of databases, messaging, REST or, you know, rich GUI or whatever it happens to be, right? You can, you can make those decisions as you realize uh, you need them. And, you know, if you look at architecture decision records, that is what they actually are, is you're, you're making an architecture decision at the last responsible moment, right? You're, you're delaying those things purposely because you don't know yet if, if you need them or, or even you might know that you need some kind of thing, but should it be GraphQL or, you know, should it be uh, an API gateway with, with, you know, different um, queries happening at, um, you know, for, for a single endpoint, or do you allow GraphQL to handle that for you? I mean, there, you know, I don't know. I can't tell you right now because we haven't spoken enough about it. That's actually the, the real answer. Yeah, and that's fantastic. I know when I first started, when I was is a, I was a senior developer and I was being challenged by someone who was, um, you know, encouraging me to grow in my career. And one of the things they recommended is they gave me a list of books. Actually, they gave me a stack of books. He, he said, here, here's a, here's a stack of books. I want you to read these. And some of these are, are books you'd recognize and some less so. But uh, he said, you know, I think I think you need to start getting into software architecture more, really start thinking at a higher level about how all the com components communicate, how the systems communicate between one another. This is really going to stretch you and help you to grow as a developer and go in the direction that you feel like your career is taking you. And so I sat down and I, and, and he must have given me six or seven books and not one of them defined architecture or gave me kind of a working model of how do I think about this? I sort of had to derive my own perspective from it until I had time to figure it out. So it's exciting to me that you, you've devoted some time in chapter eight to that, to, that others coming along, whether they just need a refresher or they want to see a different way that's defined or described or that junior developer that's starting to try to figure out what is this architecture thing? I've been coding for a while now. Um, you know, maybe they've progressed up in there and they're starting to, to grow in their career and they're trying to understand it. So uh, that's exciting to me to have that, have that as part of the book as well. Yeah. And j just to, you know, make a point, I mean, I think that software architecture has been defined, you know, by, by some very smart and experienced people as like the, parts of the software that are hard to change. And, and actually really, you know what, that shouldn't be true. If you're using the ports and adapters architecture, you might just find it, it might not be really easy to change, but it's going to be simpler to reintroduce, you know, to introduce or reintroduce different mechanisms that, um, that you found were insufficient for whatever reason, you know, say that you were using rest as a way to query um, logs of events, right. That other outside um, subsystems could do that. And you decide, well, we're now going to use Kafka instead. We're going to use, you know, Azure message bus or whatever it happens to be SNS SQS from AWS and uh, so we're now going to make that available. 
Well, the API hopefully doesn't have to change or doesn't have to change much. And you can completely change that out, that, that mechanism, the, the approach to doing that without, um, you know, a lot of overhead. So I wouldn't want to say, I wouldn't want to automatically conclude that software architecture is about the things that are hard to change. Although I respect that at one time that may have been the case. As we wind down, uh, I have two things to discuss uh, the, to, to wrap this discussion up. The, the first thing is, you know, for those that are faced today with some some monoliths that are less than ideal, whether they're a big ball of mud or they're just, you know, really difficult to work with and they're thinking about microservices or maybe they're using microservices and they've encountered some challenges or something else. What are some recommendations that your book provides for how to step through refining your monoliths and microservices to make them a bit more resilient and adaptable, how to to make it easier to work with, how to perhaps either transition to microservices or to to make it a bit uh, less of a distributed monolith and more of, you know, of an independent series of services that can communicate together. How do you or how does your book approach guiding teams that are likely in that kind of situation? Yeah, probably the the quickest way to explain it is to say, um, if you're using domain-driven design, think of either a monolithic module as being a bounded context or think of a microservice as being a bounded context, right? Um, As in, you know, this is the way that we deploy things. So if we have in a monolith, if we have um, seven bounded contexts, we have seven major modules, within it. And we create the same kind of, um, boundaries, you know, where, where we don't want another module within the monolith reaching inside either into our database directly forbid, right. But, but also just using our domain model directly, we, we create the same kinds of interfaces that we would if we were on a network, but it's just that we don't have to pay the price of the network and, and, you know, the, the potential failures that, um, the network is, is going to sometimes require you to deal with. Um, so that, that's sort of the first guidance and then being purposeful. And, and let me just say one more thing about that. The, the reason is you can develop much more rapidly if you are using monoliths, um, initially, because you're not dealing with the failures of the network and you're not dealing with all the complexities of distributed computing. So use a monolith very early. You might learn that the monolith is just what you need long term. But if you need to, for whatever reason, you know, rate of change or some scalability issue or something, you know, if you need to break a module out of that monolith and make it a microservice. Well, that's a, again, that's a pretty, uh, simple, I would hope, you know, um, step to achieve. But as soon as you start tangling things up and making one module deeply connected to another one, forget about that. You're, you're all, you've already lost that opportunity unless you do a lot of rework. So that's what we're saying is, Start with a monolith, introduce microservices as you realize that you need them. But even if you know right away that you are going to use microservices, really, you're, you're better off running everything in a sort of single VM with, um, you know, multiple threads across bounded contexts or across microservices because, again, you're just not going to deal with the kinds of complexity that you can spend days or, or weeks just trying to figure out a, a silly networking kind of thing. Whereas, and that just derails your business value production, right? So start with the sort of uncool way of doing things, but recognize that the sandbox that you've created for yourself, you're going to have a lot of traction. You're going to move quickly. And then when 
you know, the distributed computing part of it becomes a responsible thing to do a perp with a purpose behind it, then you make that decision to break them out. That's, that's great advice. So let's wind this down. I, I hear that you're working on a second book in the, in the series. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Give us a, a little bit of a preview or hint about it. Yeah. And I have to say, I was, uh, I thought that we would be able to write the second book within a, you know, very short time after the first book was done because, you know, I, I got the series right after the lockdown from COVID and, uh, you know, there was no, everything just stopped. So here's this great opportunity to write a couple books. Well, things started getting busy again sooner than I expected. So we're actually about, you know, we're, we're quite a bit behind in the second book. So I'll just preface that. We, we really hope to have it out earlier. But the second book is read the first book and, you know, everything that you're wondering about, how would I actually do that in code? And how would I do that with an object-oriented language? And how would I do that with a functional programming language? And how would I do that with, you know, various architectural mechanisms, architecture patterns, and so forth? How would I go about doing that? Well, that's what we are diving into um, with the, the second book, uh, Implementing Strategic Monoliths and Microservices. And uh, so if, if you know Implementing Domain Driven Design, my red book, well, you're, you're going to see, you know, similar uh, reflection, different code, of course, different examples, but you're going to see a, a, that kind of balance between um, content pros and, and you know, um, source code to a moderate extent with full examples available on GitHub afterwards. In, in polyglot, right? Multiple programming languages. Oh, that's great. Uh, I, I can see why that's going to take a bit of time. I mean, that's a lot of work ahead of you, but it's going to be really valuable and a great complement to your book. Well, thanks, Vaughn, for coming on and, and speaking about your book. Again, the book title is Strategic Monoliths and Microservices, Driving Innovation Using Purposeful Architecture. Vaughn, it's been great chatting with you, and I, and I appreciate you taking the time. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, James. Thank you, GoTo. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.